welcome 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 to our inspirational evening session of reading and learning and getting inspired before we sleep so welcome to this beautiful book the slight edge by jeff olson today we are in chapter number seven namely two life paths two roads diverge in a yellow wood and sorry i could not travel both and be one traveler long i stood and looked down one as far as i could to where it bent in the undergrowth then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same and both had morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black oh i kept the first for another day yet knowing how way leads into an onto way i doubted if i should ever come back i shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence two roads diverge in a wood <clears throat> and i took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference says robert frost of the road not taken a lovely poem with a very deep message there was a time when the people of the world were convinced the sun revolved around the earth a few visionaries stubbornly refused to accept what was obvious to everyone else and because copernicus galileo and a handful of other risked their lives to choose the road less traveled the rest of the world eventually caught on to what is now obvious to everyone in the 21st century the earth revolves around the sun what's more in the last 100 years we've discovered that even space is curved though that that one still a little hard for most people to wrap their minds around the truth is everything is curved there is no straight line everything is changing including your life you're on a journey your life path the path is a curve you're curving either upwards or downwards it may seem to you that today was much like yesterday it wasn't it was different every day is appearances can be deceiving and almost always are there may be times when things seem to be on a steady even keel this is an illusion in life there is no such thing as staying in the same place there are no straight lines everything curves if you're not increasing you're decreasing above and below the slight edge Let's take a look at what the slight edge actually looks like by going back to the wealthy man's lesson. If you make a graph of the penny doubled every day for a month, it will look something like this. So we talk about money and day seven, day fourteen, day twenty-one, day twenty-eight, and that is time relatively. So that's what we are understanding. This is not only a picture of compound interest; it's also a picture of how the slight edge looks when it's working for you. Now let's get a sense of what the slight edge looks like and feels like when it's working against you instead. It's simple. Just put a mirror up to the very first illustration. This graph shows you that even when it's not working in your favor, the slight edge can be very sharp and unforgiving edge indeed. If you understand and live by the laws of compound interest, your life will look like the upper half of the graph. If you don't understand and live by the law of compound interest, your life will look like the lower half of this graph. Wherever you may be in your life, understanding the slight edge will give you the tools to start fresh right now, and place yourself firmly on the upper curve. The upper curve is the formula for success. A few simple disciplines repeated every single day of our lives. The slower curve is the formula for failure. A few simple errors in judgment repeated every day. the upper curve represents that one person out of 20 the 5% who are successful and happy at the end of their lives the lower curve, curve represents the other 19 the 95% who reach their golden years angry and bitter and have no idea or concept of how they got there or why life it seems to them is unfair and that's just how it is but you and i no that that's not the case it's not a matter of being fair or unfair it's pure gender geometry the pure geometry of time most people hold time as their enemy they seek to avoid the passage of time and strive to have results now 
That's a choice based on the philosophy. Successful people understand that time is their friend. In every choice I make, every course of action I take, I always have time in mind. Time is my ally. That too is a choice based on philosophy. Time will be your friend or your enemy. It will promote you or expose you. It depends purely upon which side of the curve you decide to ride. It's entirely up to you. If you're doing this simple disciplines, time will promote you. If you're doing this few simple errors in judgment, time will expose you. No matter how well you appear to be doing right now, time is the greatest equalizer. Why people don't fly? Bishop Milton Wright says, if God had meant man to fly, he would have given him wings. Have you ever wondered why people can't fly? We have a phrase we use when something difficult, painful, or tragic happens. We say, wow, that's heavy. And indeed, indeed it is. Life is heavy. The predominant force on earth is gravity and gravity is always pulling you down. Just ask Bishop Milton Wright, the founder of Huntington College in Huntington, Indiana, who is reputed to have pointed out the self-evident truth in the quote above during a sermon he delivered in 1890. Some people, though, just can't seem to accept self-evident truths like two of Bishop Wright's sons, who 13 years later built and flew the same successful, man-powered, heavier-than-air flying machine. Their names were Wilbur and Orville. Social science research says that as a child, you heard the word no about 40,000 times by the age of five before you even started first grade. How many times had you heard the word yes? About 5,000. That's eight times as many no's as yeses. Eight times the force holding you down compared to the force hold lifting you up. Eight times the gravity against your desire to soar. Don't do that. Don't say that to your grandmother. Don't slouch. Don't touch that. It's hot. Don't talk to strangers. Don't cross the street. No, no, no. Mind you, most of these no's are well intended, like the police force motto. Their purpose is only to protect and serve. So I'm not criticizing the no's. But where are the yeses? Author Jerry Wilson, in his landmark book, Word of Mouth Marketing, bases his revolutionary exceptional customer service strategy on a statistical he on a statistic he found the average customer will tell three people about a positive experience with a business or product but will talk about a negative experience to 33 people 11 had experiences to one, 11 bad experiences to one positive 11 reasons an idea won't work to one reason it will I mentioned earlier that only about one person out of 20 will ever achieve his or her goals and dreams in life, regardless of what realm of life or work or play we're talking about. We'll see an average success rate of not more than 5%. Why is that? 40,000 no's to 5,000 5, yeses. 33 negatives to every three positives. Is it any wonder that 95% of us are failing? Is it any wonder most people don't fly? If you are one of those rare and special five percenters who decides to ignore gravity and take to the sky one of those rare birds like Orville or Wilbur who choose to break free of the downward pull of life and rise to a higher quality of life, accomplishment and success to be a pioneer and risk discomfort and ridicule for the sake of your dreams. Well, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is you've already exceptionally well-oriented Towards success. The bad news is all those 95 others are going to be yanking on you, sitting on you, naysaying and doomsaying on you and doing the level best to pull you back down. Why? Because if you succeed, it reinforces that they are not where they want to be. They know instinctively that there are only two ways to make their building the highest building in town, build an even bigger one or tear down all the others. Since the odds are against most people building the bigger one and since it is just too darn long to start seeing any results and since they are not at all aware of the slight edge, they are taking the path of least resistance and going into the demolition business. 
You can see this light edge to break free of the downward pull of life and become the best you can possibly be. Or this light edge will pull you down, keep you down, eventually take you out of your life. It's up to you. For things to change, you've got to change. For things to get better, you've got to get better. It's easy to do, but it's easy not to do too. Blame and responsibility. A man can fail many times, but he isn't a failure until he begins to blame somebody else, says John Burroughs. If you want to measure where you are, if you want to know whether you're on success curve or on the failure curve, or if you want to assess anyone else and determine which curve they're on, here's how. There's one attitude, one state of mind, which overwhelmingly predominates either side of the curve. The predominant state of mind displayed by those people on the failure curve is blame. The predominant state of mind displayed by those people on the success curve is responsibility. How easy it is to play this blame game, right? And how responsible and how courageous it is to play the responsibility game. How many of us are willing to do that? So much easier to take the path taken by 95% of people of playing the blame game. Oh, I couldn't do it because he did that. She did that. This life happened. It didn't work my way. And how many of us are ready to say, okay, I take the responsibility of whatever decisions I make. Whatever results come, I am responsible. Good or bad, I own it. Without playing the blame game. People on the success curve live a life of responsibility. They take full responsibility for who they are, where they are, and everything that happens to them. Taking responsibility liberates you. In fact, it is perhaps the single most liberating thing there is. Even when it hurts, even when it doesn't seem fair. When you don't take responsibility, then when you blame other circumstances, fate or chance, you give away your power. When you take and retain full responsibility, even when others are wrong or situations are genuinely unfair, you keep your life's reins in your own hands. Negative and difficult things happen to all of us. Most of them are mostly or completely out of our control. It's how we react, how we view, view those circumstances and conditions that make the difference between success and failure. And that is completely within our control. The five percenters who dwell on the upper curve know that there are no excuses. They understand and accept the fact that nobody can do it for them and nobody can do it for them. They live by the axiom, if it's going to be, it's up to me. They set their own standards and their standards are high. They realize that their only limitation are self-imposed. They understand that it is not what happens to them that's important, but how they respond to what happens that makes a difference between their failure and success. They're aware of the slight edge and they understand how it operates in their lives. People on the failure curve are masters of blame. They blame everyone and everything, the economy, the government, the oil crisis, the weather, their neighbors, the rich, the poor, the young, the old, their kids, their parents, their boss, their co-workers, their employees, life itself. The inhabitants of the lower curve are life's victims, the great mass of do done tos. The only way these folk can really make much sense of life is to conclude life is a bitch and then you die. I knew a man whose self-declared philosophy was life is an unpleasant practical joke which occurs somewhere between the birth and death. On which side of the curve do you think he was living? Where was he headed? Can you imagine what results that, th that thought brought? Life is an unpleasant practical joke would create when magnified by the water hyacinth-like force of time. You know the expression, be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. It's not even a question of what you wish for. Be, question, be careful what you think, because what you think multiplied by action plus time will create what you get. People on the failure curve are oblivious to the slight edge, or if they're aware of it, they take a position of opposition as if their lives are dedicated to proving that it isn't real or doesn't really work 
responsibility is declaring oneself as cause in the matter. It's a context from which to live one's life. Responsibility is not a burden, fault, praise, blame, credit, shame or guilt. All these include judgments and evaluations of good and bad, right or wrong, better and worse. They are not responsibility. Responsibility starts with the willingness to deal with the situation from and which points of view, whether at the moment relies or not, that you are the source of what you are, what you do and what you have. It is not right or even true to declare oneself as cause in the matter. It is just empowering by standing for yourself as cause. What happens shifts from happening to you to just happen and ultimately to happening as a result of your being caused in the matter. A very deep thing being said by Bernard Erhard. Don't complain about what you allow. The people on the upper half of the slight edge curve are the cause of what happens in their lives. They view all the forces that brought them to this point. God, parents, teachers, childhood, circumstances, you name it. With gratitude and appreciation and without blame. And they view themselves as the cause for what comes in their life. Are you your own cause? The people on the upper curve take full responsibility for all the choices they make in their lives and in their work. Do you? It's easy to do and just as easy not to do. And if you don't take full responsibility for your thoughts and actions and circumstances right now, will that kill you today? No. But, but that simple error in judgment compounded over time will absolutely positively destroy you. Successful people do what unsuccessful people are not willing to do. They take full responsibility for how the slight edge is working in their lives. Unsuccessful people blame the slight edge for their lives not working. Successful people know that they can't afford that luxury. Past and future. Try the experiment. Take a comfortable seated position and look down at the floor. Then... Without changing position, take the next for five minutes to think about your life. Anything and everything, whatever that means to you, just think about your life. Go ahead and do that now. Now clear your mind. Walk around a minute and come back and do the second half. Take the same comfortable seated position. Only tilt your head up to your looking at the ceiling. Spend the next five minutes thinking about your life, anything and everything, whatever that means to you. You just think about your life. Go ahead and do that now. I don't know what results you had, but here's what most people find. When looking down, it's pretty hard not to start thinking about the past. When gazing upwards, it's pretty hard not to start thinking about the future. I can promise you that morning in the Phoenix airport, every single person I saw rushing around was looking either straight ahead or down. People on the failure curve tend to focus on their past and it pulls them down. People on the success curve focus on the future and pulls them up. People in success curve don't ignore the past, but they use it as a tool of one of many with which they build their futures. People who live on the failure curve use the past as a weapon with which they, are bludge which they bludgeon themselves and the people around them. Regrets, recriminations, remorse and retribution. It seems most people live with one foot in the past, saying, only if things had been different, I would be successful. And the other foot in the future saying, when this or that happens, I will be happy, successful. And they completely ignore the present, which is all we really have. It's only the decisions which we make in the moment that are slight edge decisions. Let's read this beautiful uh, testimony of the Slight Edge by one of the practitioners of Slight Edge book. And this is about my recovery is a symbol of persistence, courage and the Slight Edge 
by Tracy Broughton. Broughton. She was Miss America in 2011. As Miss America 2011, there's a lot of glitz and glamour that comes along with the little title. But behind the glamour, what is really important is one's real foundation, which should be built across character. I want to share my story with you in hopes that in some way it inspires you and that you know that all of your dreams are attainable by having faith and determination and taking daily actions to get there. I was born a fighter, three months premature. Doctors said I was not going to be making it, but I had other plans in elementary school. My mother was diagnosed with stage four cancer and gave and given six to eight months to live. I still remember the day that my mother told me to not worry about her cancer and said that she would see my, me graduate high school. Unfortunately, junior high school, there were many challenges at home that caused us to move eight times in and out of the state. Within several years, I even lived on my own for a period of time, luckily with financial help because of the uncertain environment in the household while helping take care of my three siblings, my mother and working. I persevered through traumatic times in my life by doing the little things in each area of my life that didn't seem to make any difference at the time I did then. I knew that if I persevered, I would arrive at the doorstep of my dreams eventually. I went on to be a scholar, athlete, played varsity sports, set school records and took on many leadership roles at school, including senior class vice president. Two months after graduating high school, about six years longer than they gave her to live, my mother passed away. I went to pursue my modeling career. I channeled my energy and efforts into building my career. I worked tirelessly during the year, things every day that were easy to do, easy not to do, and was featured in magazines, calendars, catalogs, TV shows, videos, billboards, fashion shows, commercials, and beauty pageants. I believe that the perseverance that it takes to succeed in modeling and acting is the same thing that helped me with my recuperation after not one, but two car accidents. In October of 1991 and December of 1996, I was in major car accidents and sustained severe injuries that caused me to be admitted in the intensive care unit at the hospital for months. In 96, I was diagnosed hemiplegic. I was paralyzed on the left side of the, my body and I was confined to a wheelchair. My philosophies and faith are constant in my life and they have helped me through recovery and have continued to influence my life in a positive direction. The occupational and physical therapy, my rehab included working on my speech, learning to tie my shoes, preparing food, transferring, bathing and being able to accomplish every needs on my own. Through years of therapy at the hospital with doctors, at PT in the gym and at home, sometimes one to three times a day, I had to stay consistent with a positive attitude. There were years of little or no improvement or progress, yet I continue to believe and work towards walking. The hard work seemed to make no difference at all, but it was internal motivation that fueled my actions. I looked past my current circumstances and focused on the end result that I was trying to achieve and defied what many thought or that I would never walk again. I am now walking. There were no in extrinsic rewards for the subtle stages of progress. Over the last 14 plus years, these rewards only come when others were able to see me stand up and then later walk. My continued recovery is a symbol of persistence, courage and the slight edge. I went to make public appearances, win contests, and eventually resumed my entertainment career. After running three offices in corporate America, I eventually opened two of my own businesses, a florist and a legal insurance business. I'm a loving, single mother of 11-year-old identical twin sons. I was in my wheelchair when I had my twins and raised them for many years from the wheelchair. I had many reasons to blame others or circumstances throughout my life, but I chose to take responsibility for my future no matter what circumstances were presented to me. By doing the things that are easy to do yet make no difference in the act of doing them, over a long period of time, I was able to, as a single mother, become a successful business owner, servant leader, speaker and friend, as well as go from wheelchair bound to Miss America 2011. A true testimony to the slight edge. 
How wonderful. So back to our reading. A friend of mine says that people make two lists about their spouses and carry these lists around in their head. The long list is a list of what's wrong and they consult that list every day. The short list is a list of what's right. That list they read for the eulogy. People on the success curve don't wait until the funeral. They burn the long list and spend every day reading from the short list. They make themselves experts in what's right and let go of what's wrong. They never hold a grudge, not because it's morally wrong, although they may agree with that reason too, but because it just gets in the way, it just slows them down. They're too busy moving forward in future to be staring into the rearview mirror. One of the quickest and most direct routes to getting yourself up and onto success curve is to get out of the past. Review the past, but only for the purpose of making a better plan. Review it, understand and take responsibility for the errors you've made and use it as a tool to do differently in the future. And don't spend a great deal of time even doing that. The future is far behind tool than the past. The future is your most powerful tool and your best friend. Devote some serious focused time and effort into designing a crystal clear picture of where you're going. In the second part of this book, we'll take a look at specific ways to help you do exactly that. For now, I'll just say this. When you do have a clear picture of the future and consciously put every day, letting yourself be drawn towards forward by that future it'll pull you through whatever friction and static you encounter in the present and whatever's tugging and clutching you may feel from the past one last thing about past and future and i have saved the best for the last you can't change the past you can change the future would you rather be influenced by something you can't change or by something you can where are you headed would you Please tell me which way I ought to go from here. That depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, uh, uh, said the cat. As long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat. If you only walk long enough. Louis Carroll from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Slight edge life path, easy to do, simple disciplines made consistently over time. 5% success, progressively realization of a worthy idea. What's comfortable early becomes comfortable later. Sorry, what's uncomfortable early becomes comfortable later if you're responsible, if you're dis disciplined and if you're value driven. If your philosophy is... Uh, working on your attitude, your work uh, attitude is working on your actions, your actions are working on results, and that becomes your lifestyle, be it financial, health, business, personal development, or relationships. But if your attitude is what's comfortable early, then that becomes uncomfortable later, and that leads to 95% failure, which is for your life. So what is happening is easy not to do simple errors in judgment made over time again and again and again. On which side of the slight edge curve are you standing right now? Which way are you headed? Are you one of the five percenters, one of those individuals living on a success curve and going up? Or are you among the great majority, the 95 percenters on the failure curve and sliding down? Not sure. Perhaps in the middle you say, sorry, there's no middle. You're either going up or going down. The early part of both curves are fairly flat so it can certainly look like you're moving along on a nice even keel headed neither up nor down but appearances can be deceiving and usually are in a constantly and rapidly changing world like ours you simply cannot remain the same as you were yesterday you are in motion you have no choice in that but in which direction you have total choice in that you're either improving or diminishing in personal and professional value. Your relationships are growing deeper and richer or growing more stale and distant. You're learning more and more about the truths of life or slipping deeper and deeper into denial about the truths of life. You're building your long-term security and financial freedom or dismantling it. And your health is building day by day or ebbing slowly away. There is no treading water in life, no running in place because everything is in motion. If you're not improving, enriching, building, unfolding, if you're not adding assets to your personal and professional value every day, then you're heading towards down the curve. 
So let's take an honest look at your life. Where are you right now? Let's take an honest look at your health. Are you building it every day? The way you eat, the way you exercise, the kind of schedule you keep, the ways in which you take care of yourself. Are all these buildings a great feeling of health and vibrancy every day? Or does it feel like you're making more and more withdrawals from your life energy bank account and the balance is steadily decreasing? Is your health on success curve or failure curve? Let's take an honest look at your personal development. Are you learning more about yourself, about the world around you and about how life works every day? Are you learning new skills and sharpening old ones? Are you beginning to become a more capable person, one more interesting to know and valuable to be around? Or is your character being gradually etched with the age lines of disappointment, disillusionment, boredom and bitterness? Is your personal development on success curve or the failure curve? Let's take an honest look at your relationships. Is the number of friends in your life, people with whom you stay in touch and with whom you share meaningful exchanges and mutually enriching experiences growing larger every year? If you're married and you were to describe your marriage as a plant, would it be a plant that is growing taller, riper, fuller and richer with each passing year? What about your family, children, parents, brothers, sisters and others? Are they growing deeper and richer or more distant and shallower? Are your relationships on success curve or the failure curve? Let's take an honest look at your finances. Are you building assets and putting money into a long-term plan that will create true financial freedom? Is your net worth growing larger each year? Are you living within your means and investing a portion of your income into a program that will build equity for you over the years, growing dollar by dollar, picking up momentum through the power of compounding interest? So that, like a snowball rolling down a wintry hill, it will have gathered tremendous financial mass in the years when you need it most. Or are you living on credit, on borrowed money as well as borrowed time, running your coffers empty and storing up debts instead of equity, taking yourself deeper and deeper into a hole that grows only harder to escape? Are you, are your finances on success curve or the success failure curve? Let's take an honest look at your life itself. What kind of impact is your life having on the world around you? How is the world different as a reality, as a result of your being there? After you leave this world, what will you leave behind as a legacy and how will people remember you? When you add together your career and all your professional accomplishments, your relationships and all your personal accomplishments, your sense of connection with nature, humanity and God, how would you describe that overall value of meaning of your life? And in that sense, growing stronger, deeper, richer, more powerful every day, month and year. Is your life on success curve or the failure curve? Be honest about all of this. Do as Shakespeare Polonius tells his son, play to do. This above all to thine own, own self be true. And it must follow as a night of the day thou canst not then be false to any man. William Shakespeare, Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 3. That's it for today. Tomorrow we will uh, complete this entire schedule. But yes, we can read this bit and leave at the good news. So, if you don't tell the truth about where you really are in your life right now, then you're cheating yourself out of an extraordinary opportunity. Because right now, this very moment can be the time you look back on as the moment your life changed for the better forever. Life is not a practice session. There is no dress rehearsal. That is it. This is for real. So play straight and true with yourself. Take a look at your life and tell the truth about where you really are. Do this exercise with me right now. Take a pencil, not a pen. Remember, everything changes. And put check in the up or down box in each area of your life as this is below. Which way are you going? Your health, up or down? Your personal development, up or down? Your relationships, up or down? Your finances, up or down? Your, your life itself, up or down? Where are you? Which side of the line do you fall in each area of your life? If you have more down checks than up, then I have two things to say. The first is thank you for being honest. And the second is don't worry, you're not alone. Remember, gravity has been pulling you down since day one. 
Remember that you've heard eight no's for every yes and 11 negative comments for every positive one. And there's no, there, and those no's and negatives are compounding with the force of the water hyacinth threatening to cover the surface of your mind with a suffocating weed that blots out all possibility of sunlight reaching that life that wanting to try it there. The one or two no's didn't kill you. But those 40,000 can sure do some serious damage to your sense of possibility. That's a slight edge working against you. All right, everybody. Time to go inward. And bring up both the hands together in one big bud or two separate buds. And we'll be practicing Lotus of Gratitude. So let's open one finger as one petal and think of something that we're grateful for. Like this, we will do it for all our 10 fingers so that we can at least count 10 possible things that we're grateful for. Let's take about 100 seconds for this and circle back. Let's be grateful for life. It has so much to offer to each one of us. Let's be really thankful from our heart. And let's have a very promising Sunday and see each other tomorrow night, same time, same place. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining the sacred space to learn, to grow, to evolve and to think beyond boundaries. Thank you so much.